Hi, welcome back. Today we're talking about The Scarlet Letter. You might have heard already about The Scarlet Letter. It's a really famous novel and there's been several movies made about it. And it's a really important book in American literature. The Scarlet Letter was written by Nathaniel Hawthorne and he was an American writer from Salem, Massachusetts and he was born in the 1800s. We usually talk about the author's life a little bit before we talk about the novel. The cool thing about Nathaniel Hawthorne is that if you read the beginning of The Scarlet Letter, there's a little, like an introduction and it's called The Customs House. If you read The Customs House, you'll see a lot of the details of Nathaniel's life are in there. I'll talk a little bit more about The Customs House in a minute. Other than that, he was married and he had three children and even though during his lifetime he was never very wealthy because of his writing, he was recognized as a really talented and skilled writer by his peers. As far as genre goes, The Scarlet Letter is a romance. And in literature, when we talk about romance, it's not romance the way readers think of it today, like a love story. Romance in literature is a novel where you have supernatural or magical elements and the purpose is not entertainment but rather to reveal like a deeper truth about the characters or the plot and we do see that in this novel. The setting is Salem, Massachusetts where our author is from except it's 200 years before he lived. This is what's known as a frame story like a picture frame. So a frame story is when you have a story inside of another story. So like you have a story and somebody's like, let me tell you a story. And then they start a whole other story like that. So a customs house was a place where like ships would come in and they would bring goods with them, right? And they would have to stop at the customs house to pay taxes on those imported goods. And Nathaniel was a like a clerk, basically. In the customs house, it's supposed to be like a character, right? Even though it's basically him, but it's not him. It's a character. This clerk one day goes to the second floor of the building and he starts looking through like some old documents and he's like, well, this is pretty cool. Like this would make a good story. But he thinks that his ancestors would basically disapprove and be ashamed of him for being a writer. Like that's not a real job. And that's a, a concern that the real Nathaniel Hawthorne had. Another thing that he mentions, like he ha he's has these like ambivalent feelings about his ancestors because on one hand, his actual ancestors held really high positions in the Puritan community when it was founded. So he was proud of that. But on the other hand, they also enforced some punishments on people that maybe were not so humane and he felt kind of guilty to be related to them. Eventually he gets fired from his job and now he's home and now he has time to write the story that he thought was so interesting. This is the story you're going to read. This is the Scarlet Letter. We're going to talk about themes and motifs and symbols a lot. So before we do that, let me just kind of get it out of the way, like what these things are. So the way that these things relate to each other is that they build on each other. So a symbol is something that represents something else, like a dove represents peace, for example, or a heart represents love, like that. A motif is a symbol that you see all the time, like it's not like once or twice. And then a theme is a message that the story is giving you or a question that it's asking you to think about based on those motifs that you're seeing over and over again. One of the first themes that we see in the novel is that sin brings pain and suffering, but it also brings wisdom. The motif that we see with this is the actual scarlet letter, like the patch that's on her chest. Now, remember how I talked about how the book is a romance. You see that right away in chapter two. The letter actually like glows. It's like lit from within. It's like, right? And it's supposed to show you that that piece of cloth is really powerful. It changes Hester's life. We know, obviously, she's, it's not like she committed adultery by herself. She committed it with Arthur Dimsdale. He's uh, not a priest, but like, uh, like a reverend. You know, he's living this double life. He's really feeling the guilt. He may not be carrying a letter A on his clothes, but it's almost like he's carrying it around on the inside, like this heavy, this burden of knowing what he did. As the story progresses, he understands his parishioners a lot better. Like he actually looks at people and he understands their motivations a lot more. He understands the difference between how they present themselves to the community and what they may be going through on the inside and suffering that they may be going through. So his own suffering helps him understand the suffering of other, other people, which means that when he gives his sermons, the words 
hit home a lot better. He can connect with people a lot better. Another theme that we see in the novel is the question of, is sin a public matter or a private matter? You see this right away in chapters one and two, because we start off with Hester standing on a scaffold and because of the adultery, and she's already wearing the patch. And her first punishment is to stand up on the scaffold with her illegitimate child for three hours, just so that people can stare at her and judge her. So this is totally a public event. The entire town came out to like point fingers and be like, bah, 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 you're bad. Now the interesting thing though, is that they don't know what's going on. Like they have no idea who the baby's father is. Okay. They have no idea who Hester's husband is. They have no idea that her husband is standing in the crowd pretending to be somebody else. Like fake identity out in the crowd. Okay. And they really have no idea that the person she cheated with is their reverend who's up there on the scaffold like, hey, who's the father? And it's like, it's him. And he has to, act. like, it's crazy to think about that. You have these people going through an incredible situation in front of the entire town. The town has no clue about what's really happening. And if they did know who the players were in this situation, they still wouldn't really know what was happening and they still wouldn't understand. Another issue that we see with dealing with sin publicly versus privately is that they think that by punishing her, by making her wear the scarlet letter on her chest, they're going to fix her. She's going to learn her lesson. She's going to be a better person. Here's the thing. As the book progresses, we see that Hester, she's super nice. Like this lady is so kind. She, she spends her life doing charity work. She helps other people. She's so patient. Like people talk about her and they insult her. They treat her daughter horribly. She treats these people with kindness, even when they don't treat her with kindness. It's, it's almost Jesus-like. If you ask the community, they're going to say, oh, well, that's because we punished her. See, it worked. On the other hand, we see that Hester on the inside, nothing has changed. She feels exactly the same. In fact, she feels more separated from her community than before as time goes on. And she has opinions about her own spirituality that she knows would not be accepted by the Puritan community. They don't change her, really. They just kind of take credit. Another thing that we see here with how sin is, is handled with Chillingworth, even he says, I think it's chapter two or three, maybe both. Even he says that he had no business marrying Hester when she was young. She was like a young lady, you know, and this is a 1600s. So you can think of like a teenager. Um, he was an old man. He was deformed and not anyone she wanted, even remotely, but he could be a provider. Her parents said, okay, it's not like it was up to her. Now, the thing with that is, is that he's being totally selfish and, and he knows that he's being selfish. He wants a pretty thing at home to come home to every day, but he knows full well that he cannot make her happy and he doesn't care. He does it anyways. So then that brings up the question of sin being a crime or is it the result of someone else hurting hurting you or someone else's selfishness is it like you're a bad person and you're just committing a crime or is it that you're doing something as a result of some inner pain that you have and that's what needs to be dealt with the i like the whole novel we have this whole difference between public and private and there's always a tension there do we deal with sin publicly or do we deal with it privately and what what works better? What's the right way to deal with a sin? Should your sins to God be the law of the land so that they're also a crime against your community? Like, should we be mixing those things up? Does that work? Is it good for everybody? Or is it like, does it make monsters out of all of us? I don't know. Another theme that we see in the novel is related to what we were just talking about. And it's that our public self is different from our private self. I think this is just as true today as it was in the 1600s. Like who we are in, in public or online or whatever is not who we truly are at home or in private. So nowhere do we see this more clearly than with Roger Chillingworth, who is Hester's husband. So this is a guy with a fake identity. Everybody sees him as this very respectable, professional, experienced physician who just wants the best for his friend, the Reverend Arthur Dimsdale. In reality, 
He is Hester's husband. He has a personal grudge against Arthur, and his whole goal in life is to make Arthur suffer as much as possible. Over and over again, we see with Chillingworth that he is not what he seems, and his body shows it. The more evil he becomes, the more deformed he becomes. It's almost pointing to like a spiritual deformity. His soul is deformed. You see it also with Pearl. Pearl's a little girl, okay? And this town, they mistreat a kid. She didn't ask to be born out of wedlock. She was just born. They treat her differently than they treat the other kids. They call her a demon child, an elf child. The other kids throw rocks at her and they yell at her. Pearl is seen as a symbol of the sin that these people committed. In reality, when you kind of get to know Pearl a little bit, Pearl is full of life, like a normal kid, and she's not trying to be anything other than she is. So she's perceived as this almost supernatural little creature with a tinge of evil, and in reality, she's just the most natural human in the entire book. Lastly, you see this also in the town itself. The town likes to present itself as a city on a hill. Remember, that's what the Puritans said that they were going to be. That's not what's happening. They are intolerant. They are judgmental. And I'm not saying that's all they are. They're real human beings. So they're more complex than that. There's good feelings as, as well. There's good intentions as well. They think that they're doing the right thing. But they do lack compassion. They do lack vision. They are seduced by social status just like anyone else would be. They're not a city upon a hill. And we wanna look like we're like the poster for what the perfect community is. In reality, we're just normal people. Another theme that we see in the novel is the question of is evil the same as sin? If they're not, what should a religious or spiritual community be targeting more? Should we be treating evil like it's okay? because it didn't break our law. Another example of this is the town. If you think of them sort of as a collective, if you are familiar with the gospels, Jesus says that the most important commandments are love God and then love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? Because that is a way of loving God practically is by like the way that you treat people is almost like the way you're treating God. If you want to show kindness to God, you show kindness to people. If you want to um, show um, disrespect to God, you disrespect people like that. And then there's that passage in, I want to say Corinthians 13, could be wrong. I think it's Corinthians 13, that remember God is love, right? That's what the Bible says, God is love. And then it defines what love is. So Corinthians 13 says like, love is patient, love is kind, love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. That's not what's happening here at all, okay? Because they're not being patient and they're not being kind and they're not being compassionate. And they are most definitely keeping a record of wrongs closely and publicly forever they love keeping a record of wrongs so could i commit a sin and maybe like not be evil and could i be really evil but not have committed a sin is that possible and how does that play out in a community one more point about this whole like evil versus sin question there's this character called Mistress Hibbins, likes to invite people <laughs> like, hey, want to come with me tonight to worship Satan? It's kind of a weird thing to say to somebody, okay? But she does that, okay? Now, you never see her get arrested. You never see her on a scaffold. You ne She's not wearing anything on her chest. Nothing happens to Mistress Hibbins because she's the sister of the governor. That's why. In fact, she lives in the governor's mansion. Is she committing a sin or is she evil? In the society where we like to punish sins legally, there is nothing happening to this lady. And what about the community in terms of them allowing this because of social status? Are they being evil or are they committing a crime or both? And of course, the flip side to that same question is, what does it mean to be a good person? Is it following those ideals that we supposedly believe in, or is it following our social mores, like following the rules of our society? So if my society says that it's okay to throw rocks at somebody, and I do that, am I a good person because I'm following the rules? Or it doesn't matter if I'm following the rules, I'm still hurting somebody, I'm still doing something wrong. So the last thing we're gonna talk about is about nature and society. And that's the idea that society imposes rules on people that go against their nature. Over and over in the book, you see nature as being a positive thing, as like a place where good things happen. For example, in chapter five, when Hester gets out of prison, she finds her peace 
and tranquility by getting us far away from people as she possibly can to where she's almost living in the woods. Whereas whenever she comes closer, when she comes into town, that's when all the bad things happen. Another place where you see this is in chapter seven when they're at the governor's mansion and Pearl, she is very uncomfortable in that building. She literally jumps out a window to be back outside. There's also a scene where Arthur and Hester are talking. They're in the forest and they're finally able to sit down by themselves and really open up to each other. There are a lot of good things happening in this one scene and it's all happening in the forest. So one, Hester is being honest with him. So we have some honesty. Two, we have forgiveness from Arthur to Hester. Three, we have professions of real love and like spiritual marriage. There, they're talking and they're showing love for each other. And we have the sense of hope for a new future. All of this is happening in the forest. The second that they get back to society, they have to put on that mask and put on that pretense and feel all the judgment and it's all just bad again. So let's talk about motifs. The first motif that we're gonna talk about, of course, is the forest motif number two is names. Over and over again, we see names revealing a truth about a character. With Arthur Dimsdale, his last name being Dim, He's a good guy, but there's something about him that is lacking. He's not brave, like he's not courageous. He has good intentions, but he doesn't like fight and see those intentions through. He's not strong enough. Chillingworth, he's very cold. He's a very cold person. Then you have the name Pearl, right? And a Pearl is something of great value. She actually says that that's why she names her daughter Pearl. Now Pearl is interesting because usually I wouldn't say that a person is a motif. In Pearl's case, I would say so. And that's because a lot of times Nathaniel Hawthorne, our author, doesn't treat her like a person. He doesn't write about her like a normal human being. A lot of times he writes about her like she's a supernatural creature in a positive way. Nathaniel writes about her like she's, it's almost like she's here to be a living conscience for her mom. Pearl is a person. Yes, but her function in the story is very symbolic. She comes to ex exemplify the, I guess, the complexity of that event. Like, yes, it's a sin and here's your punishment. You messed up. But at the same time, this love and this um, child that you got from it is a wonderful thing, even if other people don't recognize it. And in some ways, she embodies everything that Hester is and doesn't want to show. We do have a few symbols. One of these is the meteor. The meteor comes to represent like divine will or divine intervention. Almost like, hey, you're out here and nobody's listening, but God is listening. And we have the rose bush, which I really like. That's my favorite symbol in the whole book because you see it in chapter one, uh, right by the, um, chapter one and chapter two, it's by the prison door. And you have this really ugly setting. Like everything is dark and dreary and gray and it's so bleak. And in the middle of all of that, there's this rose bush. Also remember that roses are a symbol for love. Nature, which is created by God, and love specifically can grow even in the ugliest places, even in the most bleak situations. And that's exactly what you're seeing in the story. Okay, because the love between Hester and Arthur flourishes regardless, even with all the punishment. And the love between Hester and her daughter still flourishes, even with all the judgment. Pearl flourishes even when they say terrible things about her and treat her very badly. Nature and love can exist anywhere. So the last thing I wanna talk about is illusions. And remember that illusions are references to something outside of the text and there's different kinds of illusions. Now, the customs house, that little introduction in the beginning of the book, it's full of illusions. They're all historical illusions or cultural allusions to stuff that was happening during Nathaniel's life. Because remember I told you that he was like, writing about his job, like saying he wasn't writing about his job, but he really was writing about his job. So it's all historical and cultural allusions to his time period. Now, in the Scarlet Letter, we have some different stuff. In the Scarlet Letter, in chapter one, you have an allusion to Anne Hutchinson. And Anne Hutchinson was a Christian woman who rebelled against her religious leaders because she didn't think that they were practicing Christianity in the right way. So she's kind of, Hester is kind of like Anne Hutchinson. Like she is, she is spiritual. She has her faith, but she's also rebellious and she just has a mind of her own. And she's also ostracized and punished for speaking out. In chapter two, you have a religious or biblical allusion to 
Mary and Jesus. The term here that's used is divine maternity, where you have like Mary holding the baby Jesus, right? And remember something, Mary had Jesus out of wedlock. She's judged because people think that she cheated on her fiance, Joseph. Mary is a symbol for femininity and kindness and patience and all these beautiful ideals. So there's a lot of similarities here between Hester and Mary and Pearl and Jesus. Okay, so this, uh, this biblical allusion is very apt. In chapter 3, you have a historical allusion to Governor Bellingham, who was a real governor, and he, in real life, he got in trouble and, like, lost his position because of adultery, because of an affair. He was not made to wear the letter, and he didn't stand on a scaffold, but the scandal happened, and so it's... You know, it's, it's a real story of adultery in the Puritan community with a real person and the real name. And it says a lot that Nathaniel Hawthorne puts him as a leader in, the, in this book, too, where he is in a position to judge because he's showing you, like, hey, if you know who I'm talking about, you'll see that your leaders are no better than the people that they're leading. Because this guy committed adultery in real life, and here he is judging this lady for doing exactly the same thing. In chapter four, you have some mythological illusions. This is when Chillingworth goes to visit Hester in prison, like posing as her doctor, and she's really depressed. Like she's in a bad spot. I mean, she's in prison, right, with a newborn. And he says he doesn't know Leith, which is in mythology, it's a river where like if you get in that river, you forget all your sorrows. He says he doesn't know Leith. And he doesn't have Nepenthe. In mythology, Nepenthe is a medicine or, or a substance that you can take that makes you forget all your pain and all your sorrow. He doesn't have that. So he's telling Hester, like, hey, I can't take your sorrow away, um, but I do have this um, like anti-anxiety medicine, and that's what he gives her. In chapter 5, you have another biblical allusion to Cain. In the Bible, Cain is the guy who commits the first murder ever. Basically, he's jealous of his brother. For some reason, he thinks... The way to deal with that is by killing his brother. God punishes him in a lot of different ways, but one of his punishments is that he has a mark on his brow. So like Hester, he has a mark on him for the rest of his life. In chapter six, you have a historical allusion to Martin Luther, and he was a Catholic monk who rebelled against the Catholic Church for being basically corrupt in every way you could possibly imagine. Martin Luther is the guy that rebelled and then formed uh, the Protestant Church. He's responsible for the Protestant Revolution. So here we have another rebel. In chapter 8, we have a reference to Mistress Heavens, who was a real woman. She was accused, at least, of being a witch. In chapter 8, there's an allusion uh, to something. The term is the Lord of Misrule. And you might think this is a biblical allusion, but that term is not in the Bible. So we would say that's a cultural allusion because it refers to a cultural practice in England at the time. In chapter 8, there's a biblical allusion to Babylon, which was seen as a place of sinfulness. In chapter 9, you have a historical allusion to a company that was in France that made some really, really amazing tapestries at the time. This place was called the Gobelin Manufactory in France, and they were just known for really high-quality, expensive tapestries. The image on the tapestries is a biblical illusion because it shows a story of David and Bathsheba. Um, now the story of David and Bathsheba is about adultery. One thing that's interesting about this that story is not just that it's about adultery and stuff, but that Bathsheba gets a lot of the blame, like, oh, she's the seductress and this is all her fault, right? But they both did it. And not only did they both do it, but he he takes it a step further and then like plans essentially a murder. So He's not off the hook. You know, it's not actually all her fault. In chapter 10, you have a literary allusion, and it's to a book called Pilgrim's Progress by a guy called John Bunyan. And what's interesting about that book is that it's an allegory, but he has, like, there's different entrances to hell on earth, and you can, like, go through them and stuff. In chapter 11, you have a reference to the Pentecost, which is uh, a religious event in the Bible where people experience, like, the Spirit of God with them. And in chapter 12, you have a historical allusion to Governor Winthorpe. And that guy was interesting because in real life, the real Governor Winthorpe really did found the Puritan colony at Salem. That was him. And so in the book, in the scene where you actually uh, see him, he just died. It's like he represents the old guard, like the old way of doing things. 
and now that's dead and gone and things are going to change. In chapter 13, you have a cultural allusion to a group of nuns called the Sisters of Mercy. In chapter 13, what they're taught, what Nathaniel is talking about is Hester and how basically how good she is and how kind she is. And he's, she's so good and she's so kind that he says that she could fit in like with the nuns at the Sisters of Mercy. In chapter 20, you have a historical allusion to a lady called Ann Turner. Okay, so she was convicted of a murder or at least of planning a murder, like being involved in a murder that was a result of an affair. Her style of clothing shows up as Mistress Hibbins' style of clothing in the book. The last one is a historical allusion in chapter 22, and this is where you see the procession of uh, leaders of the of the Puritan community, and Nathaniel makes a reference to the College of Arms and Knights Templar, and this is ironic. Remember, the Puritans left England to establish a colony here in, in the United States that would be against the materialism and the wealth and all the status symbols. They're supposed to basically be like embodying simplicity and austerity. But then in the procession, you see that the leaders very obviously care about all of those things. They very obviously are living out exactly the thing they ran away from. They're just repeating it in a different place in their own way, but it's the same thing. So those are all your illusions I think it's amazing how Nathaniel Hawthorne managed to get all of those in there um, to sort of build those themes. What I find interesting are the lasting questions. How should we treat people that live lives that are outside of the norm? How do we treat people that violate the mainstream ideas of whatever time and place you're in? How do you define good and evil? Is it living by a set of codes, whatever those codes are, whether those are religious or not? Or is it like you follow the law? Is our modern obsession with cancel culture and like putting people out there, is that just an extension of the same Puritan ideals of basically humiliating people publicly? But now we do it in a secular way, using technology, using social media, justifying it and feeling like, hey, we're, we're, we're better than those people and we're going to remind you constantly and never let you forget you did this, this, and this. I don't know. These are not necessarily crimes, but just things that people don't agree with. Like, there's people that maybe have an opinion that's unpopular and, like, I mean, social media will tear you apart for having an opinion that's unpopular, whatever that may be. Or having a relationship that people don't agree with. Maybe it's not a crime, but people don't like it. It's not mainstream and people will tear you apart for that. Has society changed at all or not really? I don't know. I would love to know what you think. What did you think about the book? Let me know. I hope you liked it and I'll see you next time.